Our reading comes from 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8, as we continue on our series in Corinthians. Uh, as you turn to that, we did get a, an update as church started on Yvonne. Uh, thankfully, there's uh, nothing so far that they found that is serious from her fall. They're continuing to do further tests, but so far she seems to be okay. 1 Corinthians 8. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that what we all possess, knowledge, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God and Father, from whom all things came and from whom we live, and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you, who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't you be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. This is God's word. Well, it's a great privilege, uh, as always, to open up God's Word. Uh, we have a very interesting passage uh, tonight, very interesting passage, but I think there's plenty for us uh, to glean here. Before we jump in, let's ask the Lord for His special blessing uh, upon time of His Word. Father, we uh, thank You so much. Thank You for this time. Thank You for this hour of worship. Thank You for gathering us safely. Lord, how blessed and how privileged we are to have this freedom. And while we still do have this freedom, we want to make the most of it. Lord, help us to uh, take your word incredibly seriously tonight, uh, to revere you, to honor you, to treat your word as the very word of God. We pray, Lord, that you would restrain Satan tonight, any distractions, any plans that he has to snatch the word, or to pull us away from hearing what you would have us to hear. We pray that you would restrain him and stop his efforts. And I pray for ourselves, Lord, that you would give us ready hearts. And we call upon you that you would give so freely of your Holy Spirit tonight, that you would send him and that he would come and accompany the preaching of your word and the receiving of your word. May we be changed and may he unveil Christ to us in a unique way. May your presence be felt strongly tonight, we ask, so that you might be glorified and we may know that you are the true and living God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please keep the chapter open. I want you to see a few things there. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, touching on the subject of uh, Christian freedom and Christian... How's that? 
Oh, I don't know how to put this new one on. I, I can just use this if you want. How about we use that? To change technology on me. All right. Uh, we're looking at the subject of Christian freedom and Christian uh, liberty. When you read, when you read the Bible, uh, you see a massive difference uh, between the restrictions and the freedom uh, between people in the Old Testament and people in the New Testament. So, for example, in the Old Testament, there are these strict food laws that are placed upon God's people. There are strict festival laws, there are strict Sabbath laws, and there are strict social distancing laws if you have a disease. But then fast forward to the New Testament and God's people there, and following the arrival of the Messiah and the bringing in of the new covenant, all food is suddenly permissible. And the festivals have been fulfilled in Christ. And people who have diseases are no longer unclean, uh, per se, in God's sight or for the people of God. Through Christ comes this liberty and this freedom. Galatians 5.1 puts it probably the clearest. Paul says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then when you jump down to verse 13, my brethren, you were called to be free. There is this freedom that comes with Christ. Now, over the centuries, though, Christians have argued and and debated and fought about how we apply this new freedom to situations in life. If we are free, how can we apply it? How do we apply it to areas that are kind of gray in the scriptures? or things that aren't necessarily commanded for or against. So, for example, how formal do you have to dress when you come to church? Or how informal can you come to worship God? Is a Christian free to attend a gay wedding? Is it okay for Christians to get tattoos? Some would argue that the scripture is clear on that. Is it okay to attend secular music festivals where drugs are rampant and immorality abounds? Is it okay to buy clothing and wear clothing from shops that are full of symbols of Eastern mysticism? Is it okay to drink alcohol socially in large gatherings? Is it okay to go away with a girlfriend or a boyfriend, even if you're not married? Is it okay to play sport on a Sunday or go to a sports event on a Sunday? These things have been fought about and debated for a long time because we're looking at how do we apply this new freedom that we have in Jesus? What was the particular issue facing the Corinthians with their freedom? How they could apply it? Well, the issue for them was, can we eat food that has been sacrificed to idols? Now, meat that they're referring to here was part of a ritual that was offered up to a local deity. So in the temple, the priest in the pagan cult, he would take an animal, he would sacrifice that animal to the idol, to the statue god there. Now, some of the animal would be burned up. Some of the animal would be eaten by those who were there. Some of the animal would be given to the priest as part of his wage the remainder of the meat would be given to the marketplace to be sold for everyday people, the local Corinthian coals or woolies, to buy your meat. Now, as we look at this passage and and seeking to apply it and work through what's going on here, the context is so helpful. You miss the context, you miss the passage. Just briefly, about, let's look at life in Corinth in the ancient Greco world. What it was like to be in the city. Now, They were polytheists, many, 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 many gods. That's what life was like there. Now, civil and social life were infused with religion. They were not separated. Religion influenced social life. It was ingrained in politics and society. So if you lived and were part of that city, you were expected to attend the festivals and uh, celebrations that would happen in that city where animals sacrificed to idols would be prevalent. Now, this was included in 
everything, every kind of area of life. So they had the Isthmus Games, they were called. They were the ancient uh, sports competitions. Animals were sacrificed there to false gods and the, and the animal meat was served as food. In the city festivals where business and socialising were done, the annual festivals, animals sacrificed to idols were prevalent. For family birthday parties, weddings, funerals, animals sacrificed to idols were served and were prevalent. Even if you had a trade, you would be part of a guild, part of a kind of club as it were, and you would be in a trade group that uh, believed in the same local deity. So that the, the, the image of the deity would be part of your trade. You'd be surrounded by those people. So idolatry was so prevalent and this made massive problems for the early Christians, right? Who got saved out of that. For, for the Corinthian Christians to separate from all that and to avoid participation in any of that, in all of these gatherings where this food was served, would require massive, massive life decisions. Massive life decisions. Think about it. How many times could a Christian make an excuse for why they couldn't attend that family wedding? Why they couldn't attend the, the funeral? Why they couldn't se- attend the feast? How many excuses could you make? To separate would be costly. And Christians withdrew from that, participating in that. And unbelievers didn't like it one bit. They didn't understand it, but when they looked at this Christian community, they thought this group is becoming antisocial. They're becoming fanatical. They are becoming almost rebels to the state, anti-state. They are becoming cultish. They are separating from us and have put massive pressure on the Christians. And so Christians there became divided over this issue. For some of them, to eat of this food, sacrifice to idols, it brought back too many dark memories, too many painful memories of what they used to be part of, and they couldn't touch it. For others, they said, it's okay. It's not a problem. This is where we live. This is part of society, and it's virtually unavoidable, so you go for it. John MacArthur, he summarizes the problem uh, pretty well. Let me quote him. He says this, Quote, many believers, both Gentile and Jewish, were reluctant to eat at the home of pagan Gentiles and even at the homes of some Christian Gentiles because they were afraid of being served that meat. On the other hand, some Christians were not bothered. To them, meat was meat. They knew pagan deities did not really exist. End quote. And so you can see how this was potentially a recipe for disaster for the church that could have split it across the Asian region, could have divided the church. Now, there's one other important thing that we need to understand about the context here that's very helpful in getting the passage. Uh, Before we dive right in, look at the first few words of our chapter. Look what Paul says. Cannot miss this. Now, about food sacrifice to idols. This is key to understanding the passage. Paul is not just dealing with random subjects here. I'm going to teach them a little bit about marriage, and I'm going to teach them a little bit about idolatry and food sacrifice to idols. No, this is Paul responding to a letter that they wrote to him. Paul got a letter from the Corinthians. How do I know that? Because... We see it at the beginning of chapter 7. Go back to chapter 7. What did it say in verse 1? Chapter 7, verse 1. Now for the matters you wrote about. He's finished his introduction. Now I'm going to address what you wrote to me about. So in chapter 7, he talks about singleness, marriage, divorce. Right? Now, look at 8 verse 1. Now about food sacrifice to idols. It's very, very, very interesting that the Corinthians wrote to Paul about this subject about food sacrifice to idols. Remember, when you read the book of Acts, it said that Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth. He started the church and he spent a year and a half teaching them. A whole year and a half. And we can be absolutely certain in that year and a half, that he taught them how Christians should relate to food sacrifice to idols. 
Idolatry was ingrained in that culture. He spent a year and a half living amongst it. It was in his face. He absolutely taught them about how Christians should relate to food sacrifice to idols. He definitely did. So why should they now write to him about food sacrifice to idols? Why should they do it? Well, about five years, roughly, has passed since Paul was there with them. And in five years, the Corinthians had gained more knowledge. They'd started to grow in their understanding. They were becoming more mature in their knowledge about the truth. And in those some five years, many of them now disagreed with what Paul taught them about food sacrificed to idols. And they challenge him on it. And they write to him about it, that they disagree with him. Now, why do they disagree with him? Why are they challenging his teaching that he's made clear? He's an apostle. Why are they challenging it? Was it to try and justify their sin, what they wanted to do? Well, we don't know, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It seems that they did not want to risk losing their families, losing their friends, losing their jobs, losing all of their social connections, losing everything as it were. And so they started making a few compromises in their theology. And then they started making a few compromises in their practice. And now they're attending these meals. They're eating food sacrificed to idols. They're going to the temples. Now Paul is going to, um, understand this, Paul is going to now spend chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 answering their rebuttal. Three chapters. Tonight we just look at uh, chapter 8. But over the next two chapters, he's going to answer them. And he's going to explain. And and if you catch it, his tone is quite negative. Quite negative in chapter 8. But we have to ask, what are the grounds? Why are they challenging him? Why are they disagreeing with the apostles' teaching? What are the grounds for it? Well, we see in chapter 8, what we get here, we see three reasons. Three reasons why they disagreed and challenged him. Three reasons. Firstly, to, and, he, and we'll see his response to that. It's not happening outside. First point tonight, first reason. Verses one to, is in uh, verses 1 to 3. The, re, the first reason they have is they had all attained knowledge. Look at verse 1, just the beginning there. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Now, that phrase, we all possess knowledge, that should be in your Bibles in quotation marks. If you've got the new NIV, it'll be in quotations. If you've got ESV, uh, CSB, RSV, they have that in quotations. What's going on here? Paul is quoting the Corinthians saying, this is what they wrote to him about. They said, hey, Paul, we all have knowledge. Remember in chapter 6, when he quoted them, when they said, everything is permissible. And then Paul, after quoting them, says, but not everything is beneficial. He quotes them and then he answers them. Here he quotes them again. They're saying, we all have knowledge. What are they doing here? Paul, you aren't just the only one that has understanding about spiritual matters. We all have knowledge. And Paul concedes. It's true. You do. You do. But what does he do? He confronts the attitude behind it. The attitude behind it. Verse 1. We know that we all possess possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Literally there in the Greek, knowledge swells one up, inflates a person like a balloon. Knowledge does that. Think about that. Education has the tendency of making people puffed up and arrogant. People who get lots of knowledge about finance and real estate and politics when they talk to you. Just, it, there's a temptation to just unload all of your knowledge because other people don't know. You've got all the answers. If normal education does that, how much, about, how much does gaining knowledge about the infinite God tempt us to become puffed up and arrogant? And this is what's happening here. Knowledge makes us feel uh, greater than our brothers and sisters. Now, let me clarify this. Knowledge in the scriptures is crucial for the Christian. 
We need to grow in knowledge, in our understanding of God and His will. It comes up over and over again in the Scriptures. But Paul says, knowledge puffs up, whereas love builds up. His point is, knowledge is not the goal. Knowledge is not our goal. The goal is knowledge that works itself out in loving deeds and worship. Knowledge is not the goal. Love doesn't puff up. Love builds up the assembly of God. It encourages the family of God. It strengthens our unity when we love one another. But knowledge without love is a ticking time bomb in a church. It's a ticking time bomb. They claim to have this great knowledge. They claim to be so wise, but you and I consider what was the state of the Corinthian church like, right? Divisions everywhere, factions, fighting, disagreements, inferior with the superior in the one congregation. They boast in their knowledge. And remember when we get to that great chapter in in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says this in verse 2, If I have all knowledge but do not have love, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. He's working his way to chapter 13. But they're boasting that they've attained this great knowledge that will allow them to do these certain things and it will be fine. They're boasting in their knowledge. Scripture continually says, Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul says in Galatians, May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I never boast. And look how now he cuts them down. Verse 2. The man who thinks he knows something does yet not know as he ought to know. You see, they think they've arrived. And what does Paul say? The very fact that you're boasting about your knowledge shows me and is proof that you barely know anything. Because the person who does start gaining knowledge, they realize how little they know. Is it not true? The more you dig into God, the more you say, do I even know anything about this awesome one? The fact that they're boasting about their knowledge shows how little they do really know. And Paul says, if you think you know something, you know nothing. You know nothing. So what really counts then? Does knowledge really count? Look at verse 3. But the man who loves God is known by God. At the end of the day, does, what counts is how much you know or does it matter who knows you? Paul says, person who loves God is known by God. That is the greatest knowledge in the world. Your maker knowing you. Little old you. Fleeting breath you and me. So how do we know if we are known by God? Paul says the one who loves God is known by God. Knowledge without a love for God's people is a disaster. It leaves casualties. Knowledge without a love for God means you are strangers to him. Strangers. Knowledge is not the goal. What a challenge Paul has for the Corinthians here. What a challenge and what a challenge he has for us. Are you known by God? Are you known by God? In Matthew 7, we get that haunting prophecy by Jesus. And he looks into the future and he says, you want to know what judgment day is going to be like? Many on that day are going to be standing before me and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, we did so much in your name. Lord, Lord, we served you with everything we had. Lord, Lord, open up to us. And heaven's door is going to be shut in their face. And the voice coming behind the door will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. May the Spirit of God search every heart tonight. Every heart. And I have to ask you, are you known by God? Do you love him? Do you love him? Or do you tolerate him by giving him some of your time? Are you married to Christ? Or are you married to the world? Do you love him? Because that is evidence that you are known by him. 
you are known by him. The Corinthians are way off. They are way off. They are boasting in their knowledge. Paul says you don't know. The second reason they give, we see in verses 4 to 7, the second reason for challenging him, they claim that we know idols are nothing. Idols are nothing. That's what they write to Paul. Look at verses 4 and 5. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, indeed, as there are many gods and many lords. Do you see what they're saying here? Zero in on verse four. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God but one. Again, verse 4, it should be in quotations. This is what they're writing him. Idols are nothing. There's only one God out there. What's the problem? Why can't we eat this food? They're not real. Are they not right? Are they not right theologically? Isaiah 44 talks about the man who cuts down a tree and he uses his tools and carves an idol out of it and then he bows down to that tree that he's made into an idol and says, you are my God. Isn't it nothing? The Corinthians knew enough about God's word to know that idols aren't real and that there is only one true God. The Old Testament repeatedly says this. Even verse 5 There are many so-called gods and lords in heaven and on earth. And and the Corinthians are are saying to him, Paul, there's there's many so-called gods and lords out there. We have Apollo, we have Zeus, we have Artemis, we've got all of them. But, But they're not real, they're nothing. They're just names. They're names. And it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Just how dramatic their conversions were. They went from worshipping a myriad of gods to now confessing they're nothing. There's only one God. There's only one true God. This is what they'd come to believe. This is the heart of the Christian message. This is what Paul went and preached when he went to Gentile areas. Your your gods aren't real. There's only one. And, And you remember Demetrius in Acts 19. He's an idol maker and he's furious Because people are leaving their idolatry and he's going to be out of business. And he quote, and he says this, this Paul is teaching that gods made with hands are no gods at all. That that, that was the Christian message. Do you see what the Corinthians are doing here? They're using Paul's teaching against him. You taught us that there's only one God and that these things are not real. Are they not right? What does Paul do? Paul not only affirms their statement, but he enriches it. He enriches it. Look at verse 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. He enriches it. He believes it. Don't, don't misunderstand. Don't misunderstand him. In the Old Testament, God was revealed as the I Am, Yahweh. And he's revealed as God or the Lord. That's how he was revealed as. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he reveals God as the Father, as my Father, my Father who sent me. And then he teaches his followers who become children of God to call him our Father, My father has become your father now. Jesus reveals God as the father and Jesus comes as the son of God, as the father's only son. And Paul says here, there is one God, the father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. There is one Lord. Now that title, Lord, as we said in the Old Testament, Lord is referred completely and over and over again to God. Psalm 114, verse 7, Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. And he calls Jesus the Lord. Now, applying this to Jesus, Paul is highlighting the equality between the Father and the Son. But people get hung up on this, and he says, and they say, well, well how, can, how can Paul calls the Father God, and, and he doesn't call Jesus God? Is Jesus, what's he doing here? 
Well, Paul is avoiding using multi-God language, right? He's talking to people who are saved out of multi-Gods. So he doesn't use multi-God language. But he is talking about the eternality, the co-eternal nature of the Father and the Son. Think about this. If God is the eternal Father, then for all eternity past, he had to be fathering someone. Before there was a planet Earth, before there were angels, who was he fathering? If he wasn't fathering someone at some point in eternity past, then he wasn't the father. Before I had my son Hosea, I wasn't a father. I only became a father when I had children. If God is the eternal father, then the son must be the eternal son. Does that make sense? Jesus is equal with the father. One Lord, he says. Now quickly, we also learn here what Paul teaches us. The, not only their uniqueness in, in identity, but their different roles. Their equality, but different roles. In verse 6, look what he says about the Father. And, and God the Father, from whom all things come and for whom we live. What's he saying? The Father is the source of everything. The Father is the source of everything. And he is the end goal of everything. Everything is moving towards the Father. What does he say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Look in verse 6. And one Lord Jesus, through whom are all things and through whom we live. If the Father is the source, the Son is the agent by which the Father accomplishes. And that's what we get in creation. The Father creates. How does he do it? Through the Son. And it's the same way in salvation. Salvation is from God. But how does he do it? Through his son. What, what, what do the scriptures say? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. He does it through the son. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the father except through me. God creates through the son and he saves through the son. Paul enriches their knowledge. And he enriches ours too. Now, this all seems like a massive tangent, you're probably thinking. But it's not. The Corinthians are using their knowledge about the one true God. They're using their knowledge to show that they can eat idol, uh, food sacrificed to idols. They are saying, we know that idols are nothing, Paul. There's only one God. And Paul agrees with their theology. You're correct. You are correct. But remember what we said, knowledge without love is a ticking time bomb. It's a serious problem. And Paul says to them, you're right theologically, but you've overlooked one thing. You've missed something. Your loveless knowledge has left you with a blind spot. What is it? Look at verse 7. But not everyone knows this. But not everyone knows this, that idols are nothing. Who's he referring to? Who doesn't know this? He's actually referring to Christians here. He's referring to some of the Christians, some of the newer Christians who've just come to faith. He's referring to some who are, who are very sensitive Christians, especially when it comes to idols. What's going on here? Well, some of them have been saved for a while now, and they're growing in their knowledge. They're growing in their theology. They're understanding the oneness of God and all that that means. And they're seeing that idols are just nothing. But then you have some other Christians who are newer and they hadn't fully grasped all that the oneness of God meant. They hadn't fully grasped it yet. And so, yes, don't get them wrong. They believe that there was only one God. They believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They believe that Jesus died and rose again for sin. They had repented of their sin. They'd put their faith in him. They'd been baptized and had been committed to following him. And yet, the thought of idols still troubled them. Idols were something still very dark, very dangerous, very evil, and it still somewhat haunted them, and they were still troubled by the false gods that dominated their lives before. And look at the effect that food sacrificed to idols was having on some of the Christians who were trying to be like their stronger brothers. The more sensitive ones were trying to be like the other ones, and look what happened. Verse 7, 
Not everyone knows this. Some people are, so, are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. Some of these more sensitive, newer Christians, they tried to be like their brothers and sisters who were eating the idol food. And they tried to do it. They tried it out. They tried to be like the rest of the church. And what happened? Their consciences became defiled. They went against their conscience. Paul says they have a weak conscience. What's he saying here? They're growing in knowledge and they're still trying to get over the past sins of their life. And they're trying to be like you. And they've wounded their consciences. See, for some of them, when they tried it, they ate that food sacrificed idol. It felt like they had participated in the worship of that idol. It felt like they were part of it again. And according to their conscience, they shouldn't have done it. And they did it anyway. And they became guilty of sin. I want, to, I want us to see something very important here. And it might shock you. A very, very important lesson from this passage. Listen very carefully. I may do a specific thing. And for me to do it won't be sin. But if you go and do that specific thing that I did. For you, it may be sin. For you, it may be sin. Have you ever thought about that? What, what this is showing us? Yes, sin is breaking God's law, and God's laws apply to all of us. But sin is also the willful act against our conscience. It's willingly going against our conscience. That's sin as well. And Paul is teaching us that here. Paul gets into this more explicitly, a different kind of scenario, but in Romans 14. And the scenario there is an issue between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. It's about food, but a different kind of food. Now, the Jewish Christians, Christ, they're free in Christ, but now they're struggling to eat pork. Because in the Old Testament, they couldn't eat that. And now they're supposed to be allowed to eat it. And they're saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't want to eat that. We're just going to stick to our normal diet. It doesn't feel right. The Gentile Christians, they were just going head first and saying, it's fine. What's wrong with you guys? And they were both trying to persuade each other that they should be doing what each other are doing. And they were judging each other. Another fight in the church. And so we see here how Paul deals with it. I've got a slide for us to see because I want you to see the verses of Paul's argument. Bear with me because this will be helpful for us applying it, okay? 14 verse 2, look what he says. One believer is convinced that he may eat anything while the weak one only eats vegetables, right? That's what we say. Verse 14, look how it progresses. I, Paul, know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Isn't that interesting? Verse 22. So whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. He's saying, if you can eat with a clear conscience and not condemn yourself. Look at the principle of the matter now in verse 23. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. You see that? If you go against your conscience, you're sinning. You're sinning, he says. So one can, thanks Russ, one can eat the meat with a complete clear conscience before God, and they don't sin. Another one who feels that it will be wrong and they can't participate in it if they go against their conscience and eat it. For them, it's sin. They're both eating the same meal. This is what he's showing us here. Let me quote R.C. Sproul. He says something really helpful. Quote, If we believe something is sin, even if it is not sin, if we believe it is sin, yet we participate in it, then we have committed a sin because we have done something we believe to be wrong whether or not it actually is wrong. You understand what he's saying? Now, if we're going to apply this, it's really, really difficult because our situation is so different, right? We, in, in the West, food to idols is not really a big issue, right? I know for Chinese Christians, 
it, it becomes something that they have to work through with ancestral worship. But for the majority in the West, it's not. So how do we apply this? Let me give you a few scenarios. If you find yourself in the process of buying something, a larger TV, a big house, maybe an extravagant house, and a brand new car, and you're thinking about it, and your conscience starts getting active, thinking, I don't think the Lord would be pleased for us spending like this. But then you look and you start talking to other Christians in the church and you go visit their houses and their mansions and they roll in with their brand new car. And you think, well, maybe it's not wrong. Other Christians do it. And as you're wrestling with your conscience, you go through with a purchase against conscience. You're guilty of sin. You're guilty of sin. Another one more common with Christian couples, the consideration of IVF comes up. It's put on the table. Now, one in the relationship sees this as a God-given opportunity in the 21st century for us to finally have a kid. And yet the other spouse in the relationship feels very uneasy and thinks, I feel like we are not accepting that God has closed our womb. I feel like we might be fighting God on this one. And they start discussing it. And one of them, the one who has a sensitive conscience about the issue, ends up caving in, says, fine, fine, we'll do it. For them, it's sin. It's sin. Well, for another couple, it won't be. It could be all sorts of things. Yielding to sport on a Sunday. I brought it up in the introduction. Something in you feels wrong. I should be not doing that. I've got six days to do that. And I want Sunday to be devoted to worship of the Lord and spending time with my brothers and sisters. It doesn't feel right. And then they start talking to other Christians who play every second Sunday. It must be fine. I just got to get over it. That person's guilty of sin. They are guilty of sin. And, and again, one of the more common ones, Christians wrestling, should I watch that show? Should I watch that movie? I've heard it has this. I've heard it has that. I, I don't think. And then they start hearing all their Christian friends at youth group and all the other Christians talking about it on Sunday. And so they silence the conscience and they go ahead and watch it. It's sin. It's sin. Now, let me clarify on the point, because I think you're understanding what's going on here. Let me clarify. This is referring to things that in and of themselves are not sinful. Don't, don't misunderstand how the conscience works, because you can have a Christian couple who are dating. They're not married, and they'll say, we, we, we're very comfortable to kiss each other. We're very comfortable to go away together and to do that kind of stuff. We're not sleeping together. I love God. She loves God. We're all good. And when we do these things, we have a clear conscience. It's sin. God's word says, flee sexual immorality. Flee it. Or, or the person who says, you know, I do get tipsy and I do get a bit drunk, but it's only when I get home and it's only after work and it's not in front of other people. It's sin. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's sin. Or the person who says, I could justify the abortion because of the circumstances. You know, I have a clear conscience about it. It's sin because the scripture speaks clearly about it. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? This is really important that we work through this. And so Paul is showing them here. His argument is wonderful. He's saying, you may be clear to eat it, but some of your brothers and sisters are trying to imitate you and their consciences are being wounded because of the way you flaunt your freedom. Do you see what you're doing? And Paul is cutting down their arguments. And they have one more here in this passage and we need to be very quick. The third reason, food does not make us more or less spiritual. Look at verse 8. Look what they say. Again, this should be in quotations. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do eat. This is the position that they're arguing. And again, theologically, they are correct. They did have knowledge. In Mark 7, Jesus says, all food is now clean for you to eat. They are right. Even their principle is right. Abstaining from certain foods doesn't make you more holy before God. Eating certain foods doesn't make you more holy before God. You know better or no worse spiritually. It doesn't bring you closer. They are theologically right. They are correct. And yet... Their loveless knowledge has left them with another blind spot, 
another blind spot. Look at verse 9. But be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So you may be free to do something, yet flaunting your freedom may tempt your brother. And he says, you may end up being a stumbling block. Your freedom ends up becoming a laid trap for your brother or sister. You become a stumbling block. What's a temptation? Look at verse 10. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? He sees you walk into the idol temple where they're having a great city feast. He sees another Christian walk in and another one from the church walk in. They're going into, it says in verse 10, into the idol's temple for the feast because idols are nothing. And Paul says, won't he be now emboldened to go into that temple and eat? You are encouraging him to do that and you are encouraging him to tell his content, shut up, shut up, shut up. Leave me alone. Let me join my brothers and sisters. Let me live. You're emboldening him to do that. And worse off, Paul's worried that he may go back in there and he might be tempted to go back to that way of life. See his old friends? See the old things that he used to participate in? See how life was so much easier when I wasn't a Christian? You might lose him because of your freedom. You trapped him. You trapped him, Paul says. And look how dangerous it is. Look at verse 11. It's not overemphasizing. Verse 11. So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. You end up destroying your brother. So much for food doesn't bring us closer or further away from God. In this situation, it does. Your brother is destroyed. Literally, at the translation, he is ruined. And do you notice how Paul shames their folly? His argument is incredible. What did they boast? They boasted in their knowledge and he crashes it upon them in this sad irony. What does he say? And so your brother through whom, for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. You boast in your knowledge and that's going to be the thing that ends up destroying your brother. Your knowledge. It's terrible. It's terrible. And, and, and the weight of it, your brother or sister, he says, look there, for whom Christ died. Do you see how weighty that is? You don't get a bigger argument than that. That's it. That's the top. Christian, what a terrible crime it would be if you tempted an unbeliever to sin. Christian, how unimaginable would it be if you tried tempting an angel to sin? Paul says, higher. No, you go and you tempt your brother or sister for whom Christ died. The Lord, the Lord. Christ who laid down his life. He suffered on Calvary. All the horrors of Calvary he did for that brother and sister. And you, you set a nice little trap for him by flaunting your freedoms. Flaunting your freedoms. Christ paid the highest price for that brother or sister. And Paul wants us to see something here. CHBC, look around the room. When you look around this room, you're not just seeing fellow members of your local church. You're not just looking at friends. You look around at brothers and sisters for whom your Lord died and shed his blood for. It's your family here. It's your family. Love them. Love them. This is as big an argument as you can get. And so Paul has made another thing clear. If the weak person goes against their conscience, they sin. But guess what? If the stronger one, if he so exercises his freedom in a way that tempts the weaker one, he sins too. Do you remember I said at the beginning? Loveless knowledge is a ticking time bomb in a church. There are no casualties. There are no casualties. This is so important. So precious is each Christian to Christ that it says in verse 12, have a look. 
When you sin against your brother in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Every Christian is so precious to Christ that when you tempt one, you sin against Christ. Is there anyone in this room who wants to be guilty of that? Anyone sinning against Christ by tempting your brother or sister? So Paul has responded hard tonight, but it's been absolutely necessary. In the next chapter, in chapter 9, we see knowledge with love, what it looks like. And Paul gives us a living example, his own testimony, his own lifestyle on display, what knowledge with love looks like. Can't wait to get into chapter 9. It's incredible. But that's where he goes. And then he moves into chapter 10. Let me close uh, with verse 13, just reading it. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, this is a foretaste, by the way, of chapter 9. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. There's love. There is love. Remember I quoted our freedom in Christ back in Galatians, that we're now free in Christ? I only quoted half the verse to you. Galatians 5.13, You are my brothers and sisters. You were called to freedom, but do not use your freedom to indulge a sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love knowledge with love is what god desires for his bride and may that mark each and every one of us here as we love our brothers and sisters let me pray our father we uh, thank you for your word we thank you for this passage written so long ago to a people and a culture uh, so far removed from us in a very different time struggling with very different things but lord once again your word is always timely and always relevant and always necessary for all life and godliness so that we might be equipped thank you for your word thank you that we can spend time thinking about this i pray for each christian here tonight lord i pray that we would look at our at, at the local church the people around us with new eyes that we see each other as brothers and sisters whom the Lord Jesus died for, and that our knowledge, all that we learn on a Sunday, all that we learn during the week, would be exercised and would be implemented to deeds of love for one another. And Lord, I pray for any here who may have great knowledge, but they do not love you, and therefore are not known by you, I pray you may awaken them, that they might not find themselves all of a sudden, locked out of heaven. May you be gracious. May your spirit be working in us that which is pleasing to you, which glorifies your son. And I ask these things in his name. Amen.